We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Divorce and uh, we're going to talk about marriage and divorce and getting remarried. Um, you know, it's a difficult subject. And um, I'm just going to go over what the word says. I'm not here to condemn anyone or if you've been in a uh, situation that uh, been divorced before or been a, a contemplating divorce right now um, or uh, been in a bad marriage, you know, uh, in Romans is uh, eight, one is no condemnation. So I'm not here to condemn anyone. You know, a lot of Christians walk around with a gavel in their hand. Um, I'm just here to tell you what God says. And so it is a difficult subject. Um, so I look at John four sixteen. Um now, this is just kind of how Jesus handles um, people in difficult situations. You know, it's just, uh, just want to show his spirit um, and how we should do as well. So uh, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman here. And, of course, you know about Samaritans and scorn people. No one wanted to deal with them. Nobody talked to them hardly. Uh, at least the Jews didn't. And, and Jesus, of course, you know, several occasions uh, had uh, dealt with them. But he says, Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. And he goes, what you have said is quite true. So, you know, so here's a woman, and I mean, she's gone way beyond the <laughs> guidelines of being moral. I mean, you had five husbands and living with a guy right now, but Jesus doesn't condemn her. You know, he, you know, he's, he still talks to her and he's like, so wherever you are right now, the, the beauty of the word of God and being a Christian is you can start doing the right thing. So if you've had a divorce, or you've committed adultery, whatever you've done, um, you don't have to stay that way. And so, uh, you know, Jesus talking to her, he didn't like say, get away from me, woman, you whatever. <laughs> You know, you live with a guy, you know, and that kind of thing. So, which we do a lot. We, you know, people all are living together. Um, but, you know, you don't have to stay that way. You know, but we can show them gracefully and with love what the Word of God says, which is what I'm going to try to do today. And um, you can say you don't have to stay where you are. Um, you can start right now if you aren't and glorify God from this day. If you're doing something that's not what the Word of God says. So, okay, so we're going to, you know, <clears throat> talk about divorce. You know, divorce is the uh, end of marriage. Um, one of the things that I do is, well, I've tried to do is, in my marriage, is divorce is not an option. It's not a choice. Um, you know, a lot of guys say that, but in order for that to happen, you've got to draw the line and not do the things that cause divorce. So you can't say divorce is not an option. You go out cheating on your wife and, or you're being a drug addict or, you know, going to the trip club and stuff like that, then you're going to probably cause divorce in your marriage. Um, but, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. To, uh, but if we follow the word of God, you know, it definitely makes it possible makes it feasible, makes it um, where you can say divorce is not an option. You can carry that out. So, like I said, divorce is the end. Um, but let's look at what the beginning of marriage, when God created it. Let's go to uh, Genesis uh, 2. And this is great because in our BSF class, we are in Genesis so this is uh, very timely. In fact, we just went over this scripture last week in our Thursday night class. Genesis 2. And so this is the beginning where God created marriage. And so in order not to have a, a tragic end, we need to know how it began and so we can follow the rules of um, what God intended marriage to be. So starting in verse 15, 
So the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden to work it, take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good or evil, for when you eat from that, you certainly will die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. I'll make a helpful suitable for him. So this is right beginning of marriage. So what did God say? Okay, put man, got to go to work. Put him in the garden and work it. And he commanded the man to not eat of that tree. So he gave him some rules to follow. So he's also putting the man in charge of the house. You know, said, you can't eat from this tree. Make sure nobody else does either. Um, and then he said it wasn't good for a man to be alone. So he made a helper for him. So these are the rules for, for marriage. Starting with marriage, first marriage, sinless environment. You know, God says, man, you got to go to work and follow my rules. And your wife is supposed to be a helper. We had this discussion in our, our BSF class where um, the guy was, this guy in our class was trying to, and you know, that we were talking about cultural influences, you know, different races and, you know, we go outside of the word of God because our culture says do some certain things. But anyway, so he, he was trying to uh, share the word of God with his sister who uh, has a PhD. And he told her, you know, that you're supposed to be a helper for a man, you know, your husband. She goes, I'm not being, I'm not going to help. I'm, I have a PhD, you know, he, you know he's going to have to help me do some things. You know, I, I make all the money. So, you know, being a helper doesn't mean you have to be inferior, but this is a, the way God, the foundation, the framework of marriage. And I think what happens is that we go off the page. Um, Rudy and I were talking about that before the class started. We go off the page and then we expect God to bless it. And we worry about why our marriages don't work. So this is just simple, you know, I you just go to work, obey what I say, and, and you all your wife to be a helper. Well, we all have done, now you have, you know, house, house husbands and all this kind of, whatever they call them, what do they call them? I don't know. And they're in the, when the husband stays home, and uh, you know, taking care of the kids and doing all these things, and and the wife is out working, and so those things are not where God has assigned marriage, and so some of that is going to lead to divorce if we don't follow how God has uh, has established uh, a marriage. So, um, so let's look at what. Uh, first of all, what what does God say about divorce? Um, I forgot that Malachi. Let's go there first. Sorry, <laughs> Malachi um, two sixteen. So, what does he say about divorce? Oh, come on here. Pull it up, Malachi. Here we go. Jesus says, the Lord says, that's not what I want. Well, anyway, God says he hates divorce. There you go. God does love, but he hates divorce. So that'll give you a guideline as to what... Um, God says about it. He hates it. Doesn't want you getting a divorce. But he talks about it. So going back to Matthew 19, I'm going to go reading from verse 1 through 12. <clears throat> so it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee, went to the region of Judea, to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And so 
the old law, it was. There was there was situations where you know the Pharisees thought that you could divorce for you just hand them a certificate, and you can divorce for any reason. And Jesus says, "Haven't you read?" Replied that the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, "For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one." And I did neglect to finish reading Genesis, but that's Genesis 2, 24 and 25. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no one, let no one separate. So, you know, right there, it's like God has joined together. Let no one, no man separate. Well, we use divorce to separate. Well, God says, don't do that. You know, we, this, the, the law doesn't override what God says. So actually, I mean, there are exceptions that God does allow, which we're going to discuss in a minute of divorce, but basically you're not supposed to get divorced. Let no man separate. Okay. No high, I don't care how high price attorney you are, wherever you, doing here what court you're using um not supposed to be separated according to god and so they go why then they ask did moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away and you said well <clears throat> moses permitted you to divorce your wife because your hearts were so hard but it was not the way from the beginning it's not the way god established it it's not the way that he meant for a marriage to be. He goes, I tell you that, verse 9, that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So there, you know, Jesus came to fulfill the law, you know, um, he's saying people can't, you know, follow all the strict guidelines and rules that were established. Um, so there was an out. You don't have to take it, you know, because you're involved with a marriage. One of the parties that committed adultery doesn't mean you have to. But if it's a situation that is unbearable for you, that you can. And verse 10, the disciples said to him, if this is a situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry them. <laughs> and in verse 11, Jesus says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have made eunuchs by others. And there are those who chose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, the one who can accept, then this should accept it. So somebody um, said, well, you know, this is too hard for you. Don't get married. <clears throat> you know, some people shouldn't get married. <clears throat> you know, we, we, everyone's like, you know, everybody's, that's the thing. Everybody's got to get married. You don't have to, but marriage is a beautiful thing for those who we can accept it. You know, but now you got people, non-believers, believers that just think it's something they have to do. You know, people, you see people that are single, you know, in their 30s and 40s, like something's wrong with them. They haven't gotten married. You, you know, you think they're gay or there's something wrong with them. But, you know, God says if, you know, if you, it is difficult, but if you can accept it, follow the rules, then go ahead and do it. Uh, but there are exceptions. He does give exceptions to marriage. There's outs. Um, if you're in a situation that you can't do. So turn to, turn to Matthew. Uh, there's uh, escape clauses, I like to call them. Matthew uh, 5, uh, let's go to verse 32. And I'm just going to give like a, just a, a brief overview of this, and I want to open up the floor for a discussion, so more participation um, from everyone else. I'm sure we have some questions about situations that have happened. Um, so verse 32 says, 
from Jesus. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. <clears throat> That's very tough there. So there's a couple of things going on here, you know. So if you committed adultery or did not <clears throat> commit adultery and you just decided you don't want to be married anymore, okay, so now you're putting a situation on your wife. Now she's and the person who marries her. So you know you committed. So here I am marrying someone. I've committed adultery, but she comes from a divorced husband that threw her out in the street. So now I'm an adulterer. That's pretty rough. That's hard. That's hard to do. But you know, that's what happens. <laughs> you know, we we want to, you know, change the the, the word of God. Um, to fit our, suit our needs, where we are. And say, if you're in that situation, God does give grace and mercy. But if you know what the Word of God says, because some people don't know, you, were, you know what the Word of God says from the beginning, then you should act accordingly. You know, you can't just go around all those things and, and uh, expect God to, to bless everything you do. We had a discussion in, in the our VSF class in the Genesis where I had made a mention that God told Adam, gave Adam the instructions not to eat from the tree. He didn't tell Eve, he told Adam. Well, someone brought the argument up because when he was speaking to Satan, she said, God said we couldn't eat from the tree. So he was saying that God told Eve. Well, I actually didn't say God told Eve. They knew about it. She knew about it, but didn't say specifically. It did say, though, God told Adam. You know, and Adam may have told Eve, and God may have told Eve too, but didn't say that. So, you know, we do that. We put things into the word, you know, just go by what it says. You know, don't, that one little change could lead to other changes. Well, God told her, no, God didn't, didn't say. He may have. But it didn't, the word of God didn't say God spoke directly to Eve. And the, probably the point of that is, is that God gives man the instructions on how to lead his family. That's probably why that is. Now, he may have said something to Eve. You know, like I told, like I told you, your husband there, don't eat this. But didn't say that. But he wanted to say, well, yeah, he did because she said it. Yeah, no. So, let, so these are the words of God. So, you know, and we start adding little things in there, start, you know, doing little stuff like that. Like, oh, it's okay, you know, to divorce. You know, I'm through with you. And God says, no, it's not. It's not okay. You can do it and you can get you an attorney, but we're not under the law. And God says that, you know, it's really marriage is till death do you part. That's really the law. And so Moses allowed, you know, because their hearts are so hard, you know, it's like, okay, well, you can, here, you can get divorced if this happens. But then God puts this in, Jesus puts that, you know, in there, if you don't do it that way, that, you know, anyone who marries a, a woman where that didn't happen, now you committed adultery. That's pretty harsh. Well, follow the word of God then, you know. The way the word of God is. Um, turn to uh, Matthew 1, uh, verse 19. Well, this is a situation where uh, Joseph was going to divorce Mary because he thought she committed adultery. Um, it says, verse 19 says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So back then, I mean, actually, the law was you were supposed to be stoned if you committed adultery. 
And so he thought that Mary had committed adultery. And so he was going to gracefully uh, divorce her, not make it, you know, a public disgrace. And you want to kill her and all those kind of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, when the, the woman they bought the, to stone uh, before when she committed adultery and when Jesus, you know, told, him to, told her to go and sin no more. So, um, Joseph was trying to obey the law and and do it, you know, in a respectable way. So <clears throat> sometimes we don't do that. But um, like I say, there are exceptions. You know, the exception that Jesus did allow us is to get divorced. And again, you do not have to um, to do it that way. There are, um, Jesus does bring into... I'm going to 1 Corinthians 7. Um, what is this? Uh, some situations where um, Paul talks about <clears throat> being uh, remarried and the unmarried. <clears throat> if you go to 1 Corinthians 7, verse starting at verse 8. And he's talking, um, he goes, now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if you can't control yourself, they should marry for it's better for a marry, to marry than to burn with passion. And he goes, verse 10, to the married, I gave this command. And he goes, not I, but the Lord, which is not what I'm talking about today. It's not me. This is what the Lord says. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And her husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say this, verse 12. And again, he goes, I and not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. If a woman has a husband who is not a believer is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For well, the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but it is they are holy. But the believer leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. So that's another switch on the, the word. There is another exception that if you have a non-believing spouse, you're not bound to the rules here. But it also says that you can sanctify your non-believing spouse um, through your your witness. Um, so, so you got another thing going on. So you're Got a non-believing spouse, but that's not an excuse. Oh, she did, he's, she's not a believer and I'm a believer. <laughs> Doesn't give you a free pass. Um, but, it, you know, it's a situation where you have a non-believing spouse, you know. But, you know, that's part of, you know, and it's people that are, hey, I was a non-believing spouse when I got married. So uh, I was sanctified through my wife and praise the Lord. Um you know, but God does say don't want to unequally yoke. But you know, if we, if you know that, if you knew, if you don't know, if you know that and you do it, then you know, have mercy on you. But if some people don't know that, and then they marry a, a or they hook up with someone that's that's not a Christian, um, you know, you're going to suffer. There's going to be some consequences, but it doesn't mean that's the end of your life either. You know, as I said, started off saying, you know, it's like you can still glorify God right where you are right now. Start now. Um, and I say, you know, just because, you know, God gives you an out that says, well, they're not a believer, then, okay, you, you can leave. That doesn't mean you should. You know, if you got married, you know, you made the vow, um, you should stick by the vow. You know, you should... Obey the word. You should follow the word. You know, 
you know, a lot of times, um, you know, you got two couples who get married, you know, they should go to premarital counseling. You know, we, we were doing our premarital counseling and we, our second couple, you know, they, they, they postponed the wedding. Now it wasn't, it's not the purpose of premarital counseling, but the purpose of it is to make sure that you're doing what you, you know, you're doing it, following the, the, the ways of God and you're, you're starting off with a godly marriage because if, if they had gotten married, that would what it came about would have been a serious problem in their marriage. Well, they had to address that problem before they got married and they did. And they got married and went to their weddings and they're still married. So um, you can, wherever you are, you can stop and you can start glorifying God. So, um, you know, divorce, is the end of something that's not meant to be end. Um, people divorced and got remarried. You know, I, I got remarried, but my wife passed away. Um, I married someone that was divorced through adultery. So I'm good. <laughs> but even if it wasn't, you know, we can still glorify God in our marriages. And so as Christians, we need to, if you see someone that's having, which is what these marriage small groups are, you know, our group that we had last night, we've got people have been married for quite some time. We've got people that aren't married yet. And so that's, you know, what a, what a blessing that is to, so they, they can see and hear what the word of God is on, on what marriage is about. And, there's no condemnation, no, no, no condemnation. Um, you know, if we had to uh, remarry, uh, I wanted to end up reading. Um, I have this uh, NLT version, and I really love this because it um, it gives commentary about you know certain topics. It'll go out the page and give a little summary of it, and the footnotes on this Bible. Um, aren't just cross references. It does that too, but it's, it's more of a commentary. It explains as to what, you know, verse one, verse two, what are, what they're talking about, or it'll take a group uh, of uh, uh, verses and, and kind of uh, summarize it. So th this one here is uh, what we just read in Matthew. So if you give me a moment here, I'm going to read this Matthew 19, one through 12. It's, it's the uh, summary or commentary on that. And it's titled a loophole for flawed lovers. So it's, it's um, you know, there is a, there's, yeah, I guess you can call it a loophole and, you know, there is a way you can get divorced, but they talk about that. And it's in reference to God's word. So it's pretty good. I like it too, because it references uh, taxes, doing taxes. And uh, I love that, the tax time of the year. Man, it's amazing how, you know, Christians, change the way they think when it's time to do their taxes. And so, um, yeah, I got to like, you know, and I've been there too, bring me back in line. Okay, well, you still got to follow God's word. You know, you can't go off the page. So anyway, so it starts off, it says, every year at tax time, some people grow anxious. The most de desperate and least ethical come up with creative, accounting techniques to save a few bucks, exploiting loopholes in the tax law. Overnight, the laundry room becomes a home office. The old jalopy hasn't run too well in the years now becomes a company car. That is great. <laughs> if you've ever had your income tax papers audited or been called into the government office, to explain your deductions, you can understand the feelings of those who asked Jesus about divorce. Originally hoping for an easy way out, they were shocked when he reinforced the strictest demands of Jewish law. So, yeah, they came to Jesus. So, so, how, so we can get out of this, right? You know, there's got to be an escape clause here. And Jesus said, in Matthew 19, 8, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, said Jesus, but it was not 
what God had originally intended. That's what we were talking about. It's not the plan of marriage. You become one flesh. How do you separate that? And we had a pastor, uh, Pastor Rick. I'd never forget that. You know, he did a visual December, you know, presentation of those two papers being glued together, become one flesh. You can't pull them apart. If you do, it tears. You got bits on this side, bits on that side. It's not a not a pretty sight. And it continues on. It says Jesus described God's plan from the beginning of time. In language that is both simple and profound, <clears throat> God created male and male and female. When the two are united in marriage, they are no longer two but one. In some mysterious way, marriage and sexual union turns husband and wife into a new entity that is more than the sum of its parts. So, goes on to the fact that you should not be having sex before your marriage. The sex unites a couple together. And the scripture about, you know, having sex with, with a prostitute. You want to become united with a prostitute? Um, so sexual union turns husbands and wife into a new entity. You are a new creature. Um, no judge can separate what God has joined together, no matter how high price the attorney how liberal the divorce laws, or how culturally acceptable it is to get a divorce, or two or more. So there you go with the cultural differences. Some cultures, you know, you know, the man can't even wash dishes. <laughs> you know, the wives are treated as slaves. Um, so you can't let culture or what you see around you interfere with. Uh, what God's laws have. We, you know, you got shows now, what do you call it? Um, Modern Family, you know. That's not the way God has assigned the family to be. You know, all we can do, you know, so it makes it acceptable. You got gays in there, you got people living together, and you got, you know, not the way God has established uh, marriage. It continues to say, Jesus is teaching on divorce zeroes in on our sinful hearts. We can look all we want for an easier interpretation, but the words stand firm. Can man and woman be forgiven for forsaking their marriage vows? Yes, but before dismounting a marriage, men and women should consider the emotional and spiritual repercussions of going against God's plan. So, you can do it. There's, there's, God does give ways that you can get out of a marriage. Uh, that should not be your first choice. First choice should be to follow the word of God to death do your part. And, you know, divorce is not an option in your marriage. So, Establish our legacy. Joshua 24, 15 says, For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So that's how your marriage should be. You know, when Adam, uh, when, when the enemy, Satan, came and spoke to Eve, he should have right there stopped that. He should have served the Lord. He should have done what God said for him to do and to not let the enemy come into his house. He sat right there and watched it. He sat right there and let, you know, you know, the enemy spoke to God, spoke to Eve. You know, God spoke to him. And he lets the enemy speak to his wife. Do we do that? You know, are we allowing the enemy to come into our house? We do. So our job is to uh, be obedient to the Lord and be the leaders of our house and to be married if we've chosen to do that and to follow the laws of God. It's not easy, but if we follow the laws, it makes it a little easier to stay married. Um, divorce is not an option.
that's all I have. Yeah, I wanted to um, talk about the, the, um, the, what would you call it? The, uh, the escape clause. Mentioned escape clauses, in, yeah. Mentioned in ninth, Matthew mm -hmm. 99, where Jesus permitted um, divorce because of sexual immora uh, immorality or because of adultery. And although it is permitted, it is not required. Like you mentioned. Exactly. You know, the, the Bible says that we are to forgive one another as Christ forgave us. That's Ephesians 4.32. And if everyone would take that that clause, heck, I wouldn't be married to them. You know, I, I was an adulterer in my past. And my wife had every right to divorce me. You know, she was permitted to divorce. But again, she chose to forgive. And that's through the Holy Spirit. And today we you know we celebrate 27 years of marriage. Amen. Um, I, I we just married off my, our second son. And our marriage is a testimony to Jesus Christ. You know, we're we're able to share with people because of our marriage. Um if we would have if my wife would have taken his escape clause. You know, now our, our, our one day our grandchildren would have four grandparents um, and so on and so on. It's a ripple effect. You know, the, the marriage, marriage affects kind of like what Daryl said, it just affects everyone. Sure, you're able to divorce. And I remember, you know, Pastor Rick talking about the paper as well. <clears throat> Two sheets of paper and he glued them together. He had, I think it was a blue color and a red color. I don't know what it was, but, but when mm -hmm. he took apart, you know, some of the paper was on this side and some of the paper was on that side. And he says, you guys are forever bound together. Even if you divorce, there's always going to be a part of this person with you. And you're always going to be bound to this person. Sure, you get married, but you're still taking some of this part. When he shows the paper, you're taking some of her or him with you to the next marriage. Divorce is not an option. And we shouldn't be doing the things that cause divorce. Yeah, I had that one study where the guy said, uh, <clears throat> established a legacy, he said, we're going to be married grandparents. That means it's not getting divorced. Mm -hmm. And I kind of relate that uh, demonstration with the paper. That's how you're united when you have sex with someone. Yeah. You know, because sex is a gift of marriage. And so when you have sex outside of your marriage, you bring that, you bring on that person on you. And the word says that. You become united with that person. I mean, I know we probably, everyone's probably done it, you know, hey, but, you know, that that's what the Word of God says. Yeah. And one thing, too, yeah, I was thinking that, you know, and divorce doesn't fix the problem that caused divorce. You're going to carry it on to the next, it doesn't fix anything, you know. And that's why, you know, if you could, if you can stay together and repent, you know, and fix the problem, but divorce just, you know, postpones, just eliminates that marriage. <clears throat> Doesn't fix, because you'll go to, uh, say, to another marriage and bring those same issues into that one. So it doesn't, doesn't fix, we think it does. Oh, done with that one. You know, but it, it does not fix anything. I really like the way you but, you took us back to Genesis chapter two and showed us how step one, God created man to work. So number one, you want to get married, have a job. Number two, you got to follow God's rules, God's laws. So you should be a godly man. And with that, teach your family, teach your household. And God's going to give you a helper. And women, you know, that's a good guideline for a, a woman to choose a man. Amen. Is he working? <laughs> Does he have a job, first of all? And, you know, women look at this guy's got a nice car. Ooh, that's great. Does he have a nice job? Is he, he going to take care of you? Is he going to love you like Christ loved the church? Our, uh, our pastor that we had in Modesto, me and Ponce went to the same church. 
and Pastor Rick was counseling a couple, and he, and he, and the lady, you know, the girl brings the guy. Oh, Pastor, you know, why don't you meet my boyfriend? We're gonna want to get married. And Pastor, he goes, he asks, he goes, oh, he has a guy. He goes, what's your favorite scripture? The guy didn't have a scripture. He goes, get rid of the bum. <laughs> and he's right. Get rid of them. That you know, he doesn't. He's not following the word of God. He's not going to do well. All the stuff we just talked about. He knows nothing about it. <clears throat> not going to follow that. Not about what Adam, <clears throat> what God's the the uh, how God created marriage. So how's he going to be married? On his own terms. That's how he's going to be married. He's going to be follow what to say on TV, what to say in the movies. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Yeah. So, and the same goes for a man. <clears throat> what does a guy call a woman to do? <clears throat> you know, in Ephesians, you know, submit to your husband. So, is this woman going to submit to your leadership? I don't care how she looks. Is she gonna? Is she gonna be a helper? You know, that guy was talking to that one woman. You know, he's reading. So to be a helper, I'm not helping the guy. I got a PhD. She's not going to follow you. So it works, you know, both ways. We have to come together as one. And like uh, Rudy, like we have that triangle, you know, closer you get to God, you know, closer you get to each other. Vertical relationship. No, I, I was reading here in something that in the beginning, you know, like you said in the beginning, I like that. You know, but when God created, um, you know, in the beginning, ultimately it was because of the, the one flesh, one union between God and the church. And, and, you know, so God created that and that's why he created, you know, the church as the bridegroom and him as, you know. So, uh, and, you know, in the beginning, that's what he created. And that's, and that's what our marriage is supposed to, to reflect, you know, that covenant with, with us in the church as God did with, you know, the church. And uh, so we have to look at that as that covenant. And like you said, the unbreakable covenant, it, it is. I mean, and when I look at it, when, when we do get a divorce, who wins, who wins out of this? Satan wins and Satan's going, ha ha, I want again, you know, and that's what Satan wants. And are we, you know, we as sports guys and, and that love sports, do we just give up? Do we just, lay down and let the other team win? No. We fight. We go out and we do battle. We, we go as hard as we can. We do our best we can to, to win. And that's what we need to do in our marriage. We need to fight for our marriage. We need to stand up and, and like you said, do what the Word of God says. Uh, stand firm on that and, and be the man of God so that we can have that, like, like Ponzi said, you know, so our children see that and our grandchildren see that. And what are we what are we modeling here? Yeah. You know, one thing too. You know, you, I, you know, it's, you know, we take our marriages so casually, mm -hmm. and like I say, you know, Satan is jumping for joy when someone gets divorced. Um, you will notice that Satan didn't show up until Adam got married. Adam been roaming around it all that time, mm -hmm. and hear about Satan. But as soon as he got married, here he comes. That's exactly what he does in our marriages. I, said, I, had a, I knew a couple, like I said before, it was married, they were living together seven years, got married, separated in seven months. There are people, even people that are standing up in their marriage, that they need to have strong and positive people that stand up in their marriage so that when, when something does come up and they go, man, I'm struggling, I'm having a hard time. So you made a covenant before God to love your wife. Now you go back and you start loving your wife the way God said. You know, we can't just say, oh, I'm so sorry and, and you know, pity him and, and keep him in despair. Oh, yeah, she shouldn't be treating you like that. Say no. No matter what, you go love your wife. You know, so we have to have strong men around us that can hold us up to that and, and keep us accountable for the things that we have, have uh, you know, 
you go to a marriage and, and uh, even the even the people in the congregation that are there watching the marriage, they're responsible for that marriage too, I believe. Because it's a covenant that they're making before God too, that they're standing up with this couple. <clears throat> and if you don't agree on a marriage that shouldn't happen, then I believe also in my heart, I believe that why go to it? Because if you don't agree on it, why are you, why are you going to, to honor this marriage? And going back to Malachi, where it says to guard your heart and guard yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, if we know that, that the devil's trying to attack our marriage, we take it so casual and we just let him attack. No, guard, you know, put your walls up, guard your marriage from what? It could be from, from some relationships that are negative, you know, some other couples that are negative. You know, if, if you hang around a, a couple and, and, and they're always bickering and and they're always, you know, she's always talking about her husband or vice versa. Then why are you doing hanging around with them? It's going to attack your marriage. You know, guard your marriage. Guard it from watching junk. Guard it from, from just anything that's going to cause your marriage to, to have problems. We were talking about last night, uh, that scripture in Psalms where it says, um, you know, how to... Continue to water your marriage, um, you know, that you would prosper. And it says, so when the, when the drought comes for a year, that you can still bear fruit. Mm -hmm. And so the drought's going to come. You know, they said for a year, when the drought comes for a year. So we always want to, you know, it's tough. You know, I'll quit. Let's go somewhere else. And let's end this. And no, when the drought comes, you stand firm kind of like a tree and so that you could bear fruit you know yeah. you know see trees just falling over you know the strong roots you got to deep root your marriage in the word like say in Ephesians what did you say last night wash your wife in the word mm -hmm. that's our job to do that a lot of times we find the marriages you got the women going to church <clears throat> And doing and, and taking care of the spiritual responsibilities of the family. That is very much contrary to what the Word of God says. Yeah, another great truth that you brought up was in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about having an unbelieving spouse. So 1 Corinthians 7 13 says, and if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. And verse 14, for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through the, her believing husband. Otherwise, her children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. And so we look at something like this and think, how is this possible? My wife isn't safe. How could she be sanctified? Or my husband isn't safe. How could you be sanctified? My children are, are you know, they're, they're, how could they be holy? Um, but if you remember the Passover, remember uh, the Passover, God told the Israelites to put blood on the doorposts, right? And at night, the spirit, uh, the the angel was going to come, and whoever did not have the blood on the doorpost was going to go in there, and the firstborn was going to die. But if you saw the blood on the blood on the doorpost, he would pass it. So the believing spouse has put the blood of Jesus on his household, and the entire household is sanctified. See, so when the angel was passing by and he saw blood, he didn't go around saying. Oh, there's an unbeliever in that house. Let me go in there and attack. The whole house was sanctified. Same thing happened with Rahab in, in Jericho. Jericho, because of Rahab, her entire family was spared. And we say that they were all believers? I don't know. But God sanctified them because of her. So yeah. that's why here he's saying if you're a believer, you don't have faith. Your family sanctified as it is, and your children are holy as it is. You know, and, and, and there was a fine example of that. He says that his wife was a believer. He wasn't. And same thing with Rudy. And eventually, here they are today. Who would have thought all these years later they would be preaching the gospel? 
I wonder if you're, what, what, what can your wife say? Answered prayer. That's what they say. Praise God. Same thing for my wife, you know? Answered prayer. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 5, 15. That, I like that. Walk in wisdom. See then that you walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the day is the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise. <clears throat> Understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is uh, dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your own heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. See, so that, that I like that because we have to be wise. We can't, like you, like Ponty was saying, you know, don't hang out with those that, that are going to corrupt you guys or, or corrupt your marriage. But I, I know even though you're strong in the Lord and, and, and um, you know, you know who you are in the Lord, that you can, you still overcome that. But, you know, allowing, you know, like the wife, don't allow her to go to places that, that might corrupt her and put her in a situation that might harm her and harm your marriage. And that's the same with us too. We need to do that. We need to guard our hearts. Yeah. Very good.